Hey, and good day there. In this experiment, we're going to be seeing if it's possible to make a steam turbine out of plastic, get it to spin, generate some electricity, collect some data, and then use that data to make a second iteration and see if it's better than the first. So let's get started. As a starting point, I just sketched some blades around a 5 8 bearing, since that's what I had on hand from another project. For the material selection, the tricky part wasn't necessarily finding a plastic with a high enough melting point, since all the plastics are greater than 100C, it's the glass transition temperature. That's the temperature at which plastic starts to get soft and squishy, and is also why it tends to be pretty close to the bed temperature when printing these. I ended up selecting polycarbonate for its temperature resistance, but it was a decision which I soon came to almost immediately regret. Although I had no issues pressing the bearing in, the material seemed to be more prone to warping than I thought it would be. Looking at the sides, we can see just how badly the print started to come off the bed, but thankfully we managed to finish in time before it peeled completely off. The blades weren't quite as bad, so I went ahead and popped them in. For the cover, I thought it would be a nice touch to have something that's completely transparent, so I decided to cut it out of clear acrylic glass. With our first prototype completed, I went ahead and tested it out pneumatically with some compressed air. Now that we know that it spins, it's time to fire up our burner and produce some steam. What's important to note here is how much water droplets are condensing out of our steam and the temperature at which our outlet is. We can analyze this later and see how it affects the system. Hooking it up to the steam, it started to spin, however I found the clearance between the cover and the top of the blades was just a little too tight, so I had to loosen it up, and afterwards it seemed to spin freely. After running it for a few minutes, I opened it up to see how it fared, and overall it seemed to have survived. The only major issue was that I made the walls just a little too thin, and the bottom seemed to warp at the edge. Not wanting to be delayed, I just ripped that part off and continued as if it never happened, which seemed to fix the issue. The next question is, can we generate some electricity? So I got a small DC motor and hooked up a coupling to it. However, it appears there is some wobble, which will lead to some shaking issues later. However, the shaking won't stop me from trying to collect some measurements, and I'll start with my ammeter by briefly shorting the motor for just a couple of seconds to measure the short circuit current. After I was done with the ammeter, I switched over to voltage and collected some information on the open circuit voltage. Once I collected my data, it was time to shut the prototype down and head back to the drawing board. Looking at our system, we can start by analyzing the steam, the turbine, and then finally the results from the motor. Just looking at the outlet, we can tell that we definitely have a saturated mixture, also known as wet steam, which means there's tons of suspended water droplets being left behind in our turbine. Doing some quick research, it turns out most steam generation applications aim to be at least in the superheated region, meaning all the water has been completely boiled into a gas. Since not only does that increase efficiency, but the drier steam leads to less wear and tear on components. Looking at our turbine, even after brief testing, all of the water left behind meant that the bearing already started to show signs of corrosion. On a footnote, super efficient steam power plants actually operate in the supercritical zone since at least in theory, your efficiency is constrained by the ratio of your hot and cold sides. In our case, with an ambient temperature around 20 degrees and our outlet temperature around 98 degrees, our maximum theoretical efficiency is only 21%. However, you can see if that temperature was able to be pushed up, so would the efficiency. Moving on to the turbine and starting with the inlet, for our low speed application, a better nozzle design would probably be a converging nozzle since the narrowing would help to accelerate the steam. Another thing to look at is the clearance between the tips of our blade and the body, since the bigger the clearance, the more steam that's going to leak and not contribute to turning the blade. 
Speaking of blades, we can analyze the spacing of our blades with the pitch to chord ratio, which tells us how dense our turbine is with the lower ratio meaning there's lots of blades, which will increase energy capture but will also lead to more drag compared to fewer blades. Depending on the application, the optimal ratio will change, however some of the ranges I've seen when looking into lower pressure applications tend to be around the 0.75ish, which means for our application this number could be on the high side. And for the individual blades themselves, when I looked into the shapes used for impulse turbines, they tend to have more of aggressive, kind of a bucket shape to them, since the idea is to try and capture as much of the momentum coming out of the jet. This means, for the second iteration, we could probably do with a more aggressive curve. Size-wise, a longer blade is better for lower RPM applications, whereas a smaller blade will make it spin faster. Although I could get a higher voltage by driving the motor shaft faster, the wobble and unbalanced rotor means I don't plan on increasing the speed. For the height, it needs to be tall enough to capture the jet of steam coming out of the nozzle, meaning it needs to be a little bit larger than the nozzle diameter since gas will expand as it shoots out. Since my nozzle has a small diameter of 3mm, I think I can reduce my blade height. And lastly, looking at the motor, if we multiply our open circuit voltage times the short circuit current, we get a total outstanding wattage of 0 0.0106 watts. Putting it all together for the redesign of our first prototype, we'll start by tightening the tip clearances, making the curve a little more aggressive to capture more momentum, I'll thicken the body to prevent warping, and we'll add more clearance from the turbine top to the cover. We can also shorten the blade height, and this might reduce the wobble. Having a look at the redesign, we can see that the curvature is definitely a lot more aggressive, and I also increase the number of blades to keep up with our pitch to chord ratio. For the body, I thickened it up, and when comparing it to the old one, not only did the height reduce, but we also managed to reduce the warping. Hooking it up to steam, it became quite obvious that the new design could capture momentum a lot better, since it seemed to start turning a lot sooner whereas the old design I had to really wait for the steam to pick up. But the real question is, can we quantify the improvement and see some better numbers in the electricity department? Hooking up the motor, it seemed to wobble less than before, and it became very apparent early on with the voltage that we're definitely going to be generating more electricity this time around. Our open circuit voltage seems to have doubled. On the current side of things, our short circuit current also seems to have roughly doubled at around 150 milliamps. Looking at the turbine after the testing, the thicker bodies seem to have fared a lot better this time around, with no noticeable warping and the blades still able to spin freely despite the tighter tip clearance. Quantifying our results, we seem to have a peak power of around 0.0431 watts. Compared to our old design, that's about a 4x increase. Overall, we were able to design a turbine out of plastic, get it to spin, redesign it, get it to spin again but better this time, and learn something along the way. So with that said, thank you for watching.